Hey guys, this is Ken McRoy, and you are listening to the Mailbox Money Show with Bronson Hill. All right, welcome to the Mailbox Money Show. I am Bronson Hill. Today we have an awesome guest, Nathan Webb, who is uh, working in 1031 exchanges. He's been doing it for years. We've actually been friends for quite a while. We met at a meetup years ago before COVID. And he has a great personal bio story of how he kind of got started in it. He's also been a syndicator, done a lot of different things, a business owner. And 1031s are really exceptional. Uh, where I've seen investors, we've had a number of investors, three or four investors the last year or two, that have 500K to a million or more, and they will basically sell a property that's a rental or some sort of income property. They'll be able to use that equity and be able to roll into another deal as a tax-exempt exchange. It's called a 1031 exchange. Some of you are familiar with it. Some of you may, may, be, may be new to you, but it's awesome when you start developing some equity, whether through a single family or a syndication or different things. We're going to jump into that. We're going to talk about some of the special things that go into 1031s. You may think you know a lot about 1031s, but there's a lot more to know. And especially if you have equity, you have a house, you have properties, you want to know how you can do that. I literally know a cousin of mine, you know, helped me get started in real estate, started with a duplex and, you know, did this for, you know, now is doing 10, 20, 30 million plus type of properties just from a 1031 to 1031 to 1031. So there's a process on how that goes. We're gonna talk about some best practices. So let's jump in. So Nathan, how you doing, buddy? Good to see you, man. Excited you're here today. Yeah, excited to be with you, Bronson. It's been a minute, but uh, so happy to see you. Yeah, you were in LA. I know we met at the meetup, the multifamily meetup here in Pasadena, and now you're in Atlanta. You and your, is it five kids? Four kids? <laughs> Not quite. Nope. Four. I'm, I'm just, four, I'm just four, blessing you with another child. There. I just, I just spoke another one who existed. I, yeah, I appreciate the bonus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Um, so tell, tell us a little bit of your story. I know you've, um, you, you, you did some nonprofit work overseas and that opened up some doors. You've been in investing a while. You've had a lot of vision to, to really help people in the nonprofit space, as well as other investors, you know, as a syndicator, as a, you know, as a, what's called a 1031 accommodator, where you accommodate and you, you actually hold the third party that holds the capital when a property is sold. Can you talk a little bit about your story and your journey? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I grew up in Oklahoma, actually. Um, I grew up doing a lot of manual labor. My dad was in construction um, and I started helping him at a, an early age. Um, and was like, well, I, I don't want to do this the rest of my life, so I better go get a degree. And then went to the opposite extreme and got a computer science degree and did that for a while and was like, I really don't want to be in a chair all day. You know, I'd rather be doing something. And so flipped out of that and did oil and gas. Uh, I was a roughneck for a while, so I worked in upstream production because it's Oklahoma and Texas. It's it's jobs are there. And I wasn't afraid to get my hands dirty. Uh, learned a lot there. Um, very interesting environment. But my what really changed for me was I really wanted to go do nonprofit work in college. Um, and so went for to work for a Christian nonprofit and went overseas uh, to the Middle East, actually, and did some relief work and figured out that really helping people economically. Um, so was probably the best, best solution rather than just like, hey, we should give people beds and clothes and make sure they have food. It's like that. That's good for certain seri uh, scenarios, but people really need they need some of their own equity. Right. right. They need some of their own value to say like, hey, I can do this for myself. Um, and so but to just have a job, to have an opportunity. Um, and so becoming an entrepreneur in a developing nation um, in a different environment is really what just kind of inspired me to keep doing entrepreneurship. And in right. doing that, I had to go through a lot of real estate as well. In another Real quick, let me pause you one second real quick. Yeah. I, I think. Um, you and I, I think we resonate on this because I also did some nonprofit, uh, you know, in another country in college. And it was just like the impact of realizing when you can teach people how to fish, right? You actually can not just give handouts, but you can empower people. And that's really what we're doing too when it comes to passive income, right? Is we're, you know, we're actually, and, and you as well, we're educating people on how to make better use of their capital and how to get more financial freedom, which is awesome. And that's, it's amazing if you know, there's a quote by Zig Ziglar, you can have anything you want in life if you just help enough other people get what they want. And it's the idea of like, you know, seek the kingdom first, right? Seek, seek the, you know, helping others and, and serving others. And then all these doors can open for you. So you did that and you said doors open, it led you to real estate. So talk a little, go pick up from there. Well, I, I also just wanted to agree with you too, because I think, you know, yeah, seek first the kingdom and all these other things will be added unto you. What is the kingdom? It's people. Right. There's no need for apartment buildings. There's no need for real estate without people. It just is all kind of there. Right. And, and nature is beautiful. But so much of the real estate work that I did was just like, hey, how do we fit the business that we have um, or that we're developing? It has a real estate need. 
how do we you know redevelop that repurpose it for the need that we have and so I started negotiating leases I started doing project management um overseas and it was just like oh, I mean real estate's real estate no matter where no matter where you do it um but we actually started a CrossFit gym and I ended up building four gyms while I was overseas awesome. and uh was you got like, really pumped while you did it right you can help uh, me yeah, well I tried yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome but i i really love the the project management aspect of it i really like the real estate negotiation finding the site you know negotiating the lease and everything and so um upon my return to the united states i just dove in the real estate full time and that that looked like a lot of things it looked like me it's like oh i guess i should get licensed right and a lot of people do that so we moved back to california which is where we met my we had our fourth kid while we were there in pasadena um, so we had three kids born overseas, but went back to Pasadena and I just started hustling real estate and figuring it all out um, and cut my teeth on multifamily in Los Angeles. And so was really doing a lot of acquisitions at the same time, started up a 1031 exchange accommodating business because um, that entrepreneur bug just never leaves. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and so really started figuring out how to put even syndications and 1031s together or even exchanging other syndications that I knew of partners that I'd worked with, like, Hey, this is, this is how you would do that, you know, or does this qualify, but basically just getting, jumping in head first and saying, Hey, how do, how do I figure out these more complex exchanges and had a really good mentor who'd been doing tax deferred exchange for over 30 years, still does them today. And he's still my mentor. I still call him up anytime I have a tough question, but that's, right. that's kind of how it all got rolling. So this is a huge thing that I think, and this is why I wanted you to come and share, is just that a lot of people, um, you know, we do get depreciation with real estate. So with syndications, with other things, there's depreciation, but um, it doesn't always account for all of the gains or there's things that you have to continually try to find more depreciation versus it's very clean if you can have a 1031 and be able to um, exchange it a new property. And I know I heard a stat somewhere that a lot of uh, I don't know what the stat was, but exa you know, exactly. But a lot of people that attempt to do a 1031 exchange don't actually achieve a 1031 exchange. And so what they'll say is, okay, I'm going to sell this property. I've got it under contract. I'm going to sell it to someone else. Maybe it's a, a duplex or it's a five unit or whatever, or they're part of some deal. They're going to sell it. But then they only, they, you know, it's a very tight window of what they're able to identify. And then when they have to close, can you just talk a little bit about, um, uh, kind of how that process works when someone is like, you know, selling or it's kind of an after the fact thing, right? Because people, maybe you get the call that's like, oh, hey, I just sold my property and I've got, you know, 45 days to identify or like, what, can you talk about like those windows and kind of where people get hung up on that timeline? That, that is a great and multifaceted question. So I'll try to, I'll try to break it down a little bit. Um, so, right. A, a tax deferred exchange, you know, people, people think, okay, well, this is a tax process. Well, it's, it's a real estate transaction as well. So uh, a qualified intermediary is required by the 10th section of 1031 of the tax code that says, basically, you must have the property that you're selling. You must have your qualified intermediary in place. And when the sale closes, you cannot take any constructive receipt of your funds. They need to go to the qualified intermediary. So they hold it. And then you find your other property. And then you tell the qualified intermediary, go send in my funds here for closing. Right? So it is a transaction between transactions. That's the first point, right? And it does have to do with your taxes. So, but it it's it goes on to next year's reporting or the report that and when you sold the property goes on to that year's, you know, tax report. Mm -hmm. um, but it also, if you fail or if you have a partial exchange or a fully deferred exchange, that needs to be indicated on your tax report as well. So you can't call me after you sell a property and say, hey, do my exchange for me. You have to get me involved before or during this, the process of the sale, like before you actually close. Um, but you can't, you know, you can't call me after the fact because I have to, I have to work with transactions because it is a transaction between transactions, as I said. So that that's kind of the first point mm -hmm. um, to, to know that it's a transaction. The the other part is people don't understand a hundred percent of what they're actually deferring. It is not, it is not tax forgiveness, right? It is not a full tax exemption. Um, but you're essentially taking a hundred percent of what you gained and what you would owe, you no longer owe so long as all of that money goes into a replacement property of equal or greater value. Right. 
what you would be deferring is not just federal capital gains tax either. It, it would also be any for the state. And yeah. it would also be any depreciation recapture. So depreciation recaptures 25% of whatever you depreciated. And I know you work probably a lot with cost segregation where they're getting a rapid depreciation. So that can offset gains, but it's still due when you sell that property, except sure. when you 1031 exchange and then it, it continues to roll forward. So let me, let me stop you there one sec, because I think that's a good point. So when someone sells, and this is why it's important to know people like Nathan and reach out and connect because they are QIs or qualified intermediaries. They do a great job in this space. Um, and it's important you have people that can help you on this. So when someone, like, let's say we have a multifamily property that we have last up to last year was hundred percent depreciation. So let's say we got, you know, 90% depreciation last year for that. And we bring it forward to, you know, we sell it, you know, this year or a few years from now, whatever. So we have to recapture whatever years we did not use on a pro rata basis, right? So if it was like a 25 or 27 and a half year schedule of depreciation, we have to recapture. Is that correct? Or is it only 25% of the total amount that you depreciated? Oh, so you're on, you're on mute there, buddy. So it has to do with what you've depreciated already. And I'm not, I, I'm not your tax expert. I'm right. Not, yeah, yeah, I'm not right. giving tax well, advice. You yeah. depreciated this and therefore this much is due, but it should be, you know, so the longer you've held something, the more you've depreciated typically. And then, but also you had a lower basis that you started from. Right. But it's just to know that whatever, essentially, if you bought something for $500,000, let's do 400 for easy math, $400,000, regardless of how much it appreciated, you would also be deferring that as well but you fully depreciated that property. So you depreciated $400,000 of that initial buy value. You would owe $100,000 in depreciation recapture. So 25%. Okay. Now, if you added more value and depreciated that as well, that's a totally different story. So I don't know that exact numbers, but it's 25% of what you depreciated by my understanding. And, and if you have other depreciation, could it cover some of that 25% or it just never covers? Like if you had enough depreciation in other properties that you had, or is that just a tax? I'm not a depreciation question? expert, right? <laughs> I know. I know <laughs> that that for the sake of the 1031, that all essentially rolls forward. So you don't have to pay it if yeah. you do the exchange. You roll it forward, yeah. Right? You roll it all forward. And then if you ever were to sell that replacement property though, and not do another 1031, then it's owed back. Remember, it's deferral, not forgiveness. Right. Um, and then how that affects your replacement property in terms of depreciation value, I don't well, know. And, but and, that's, and this that's is, where your cost segregation, your CPA experts come into play. Yeah, this this question comes up a lot. I get this question, you know, over 1,500 one-on-one -on -one phone calls with high net worth investors. And so this question comes up, well, you know, after this multifamily deal, you know, we're multifamily operators as well as other things. And, you know, after we sell, uh, is there a 1031 exchange option? A lot of people want to know that. A lot of times what we say is, well, we, we, we hope so. We're not sure. It depends on the time. It depends on a lot of things. And I know that's common now. A lot of syndicators, when they you know have people invest in an apartment building, they'll line up another deal kind of to be ready about the same time. Um, and it kind of goes to the timing as well. Because I think we were kind of touched on timing stuff for a little bit here. Um, a lot of people will get you know, kind of like 11th hour, hey, I, I want a 1031. And then they just, they won't be able to identify within that tight window of uh, 45 or 60 or whatever that time frame. It's a very short window. But, uh, you know, my cousin that I mentioned, he would always basically get his property ready to sell. Then he would get the new property under contract first and build some extensions in there. Say, hey, we'll close in 60 days, but I'll make 100 or 200k more hard or non-refundable every 30 days and he'll have a you know a, a total of up to like two or three extensions and then he'll list his 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 property and he's been able to do every time where he's been able to like get the new one under contract because the challenge is sometimes if you have to buy and someone knows you have to buy you can get kind of screwed in a 1031 because people say well these guys have to close so then they can just ask for whatever they want and they know that you have to close otherwise you're going to get this huge tax bill right so do you, how do you kind of advise people through that process? Well, I think the biggest and best exchangers are like your brother, right? My cousin, yeah. brother, right? My cousin they're, yeah. They're prepared. They're, they're the best Boy Scouts, right? They're always right. prepared and they're always thinking ahead. So the best people who, who exchange with me, they're, they're calling me before they even list their property. Hey, yeah. this is what we want to do. This is kind of our goal. I'm like, okay, that's great. That seems like a reasonable goal. I usually ask, do you even need to do a 1031 exchange? Well, I haven't held it long enough or it hasn't really appreciated that much. And maybe it's not worth the hassle. 
they'd rather pay the taxes. That's not a choice I can make. I can just say, hey, this, yeah. is, this is kind of what it looks like to me. Is that the case? Um, but you can certainly be creative on the contract transactional side. So you can you can say, hey, I want to put in some extensions on the buy side or even the sell side, right? I need I need the counterparty to help accommodate my exchange at no cost to them, right? And, you know, I've already paid for the qualified intermediary, but I just need you to give me a little bit of wiggle room. Give me an extra yeah. extension. I'll, I'll pay a, an extra hard earnest money deposit or something like that. Right. And because all that needs to happen for the 1031 exchange is you don't touch the money. It goes... Yeah from the sale to the QI to the purchase and you don't touch it. Yeah. So if you can line up those contracts, you know, within a within a very tight window, it makes it a lot easier. I'm sorry about that. Oh, going. you're fine. Yeah. No, that's right. And and that brings me to a point um cuz this question I I get quite a bit with uh people, you know, somebody said I have this all the time people say, "Oh, I've got a 1031. I've got 50k or 100k coming out of a deal. Can I put it in your syndication?" And we typically have a rule where somebody has, you know, around 500K is usually the minimum. We've done maybe slightly less, but usually 500K, it's a pain in the butt to do in a syndication, but you can sell a property and roll into a syndication through something called a tenants in common where an entity is set up. It's, it's a little bit of work. You give your voting rights over then to the, or the operating rights to the operator and it's, it can work. But again, we've typically done it for 500K or more, we've had a million dollar, we've had, we've had different ones. You know, some people have done very, very large ones. We have some investors that are, you know, millions of dollars that are trying to figure out where to place this money. But uh, what, you know, what, what is the kind of the lower amount that typically you would, I mean, you see, I mean, is it generally at least a few hundred thousand, even if it's on private properties, do people do it for 50 or hundred K? Right. So that, that's a very interesting question. And it really depends on the syndicator. So I've had people do very small deals where they've just said, hey, I want to exchange into a deal with a buddy and I'm bringing yeah. in 100K and they found this $400,000 apartment building or something like that. I'm bringing in, you know, they're bringing in 100K, I'm bringing in 100K, but mine's coming from an exchange. Yeah. How do we put this together? And it still has to be done the same way through right. tenants in common, which is a very old title structure. It's how partnerships were put together back in the day before... We had even corporations and waterfall structures and preferred rates of return and all these other securities offerings or semi-security offerings, whatever they are. It's just like, hey, this is how you buy real property, which is the other qualification for a 1031 exchange. You got to go from real property to real property, and you've got to be the same taxpayer to the same taxpayer. So that's why you can't go into a syndication and be like a limited partner because that's personal property, not real property. You're getting shares of an LLC rather than you're getting a portion of real property. And so you're really along and you're the same taxpayer. So you're you're kind of, you know, if you were slicing a pie, you're just getting a, a slice of the pie and then the syndication has the rest and they can chop that up however they need to. But you have to get you have to get some title in return. You have to get some real property as an exchanger. But that can happen on the small scale. Yeah. Cuz that's just a, it's just a title structure. Your local yeah. attorney should be able to do it or they don't know how on the on the small level. They probably shouldn't be an attorney, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, there's different types of attorneys. It can be for syndication. It does. There's an extra cost. It costs us right. usually about nine or ten k additional. But you know, we typically say it's a minimum cost. It's just a pain though. And I, I wanted to share this story. I shared this with you a little bit before. We had we had a 1031 uh, a guy who had a relationship with the 1031, and he basically this 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 QI or this qualified intermediary, kind of like what you guys are. He was not as familiar with syndications. And, you know, the way it works from a you know, transaction standpoint is uh, all the money has to get wired in on the same day and it has to come from the qualified intermediary on closing day. So it has to come in. So basically we have, and I think this was about a $7 million raise. We had about 500 K coming in from this one QI and we couldn't reach the guy the whole day. His assistant couldn't reach him. Who knows what the guy was doing? And finally, like in the afternoon at 1.32 p.m., which this was a, a, a Jacksonville property. So it was you know close to 5 p.m., which is the time where everything shuts down for wires and everything. Well, he wires at the last minute. So the funds are received at like 4.59 p.m. And this was like the last extension on the deal. So we're like, is this deal going to close? We don't know because it show, when it shows up at 5.00, you can't just close like title and escrow is there. They've got to transfer money and they can't transfer the money because it's 5 p.m. So we all kind of sit there like, uh, I think, I hope we close, whatever. So they closed it the next morning, but it put the whole deal in jeopardy, right? This one piece, which was 500K out of a $7 million raise, 
And so um, I want to like bring it back here for a minute. Uh, what are some some best practices of a good QI? Like, what are some things that you see good QIs doing? Well, I mean, it, it's hard not to be biased, of course, uh, because I've heard some horror stories as well uh, about other people dealing with other exchangers to be be nameless in this context. But um, similar story, similar story for us was that you know when we are working with these these higher level syndicated deals where they're bringing in exchangers that there's a lot of moving parts and most people don't want to do them because there's so many moving parts and they can get very complicated very quickly and then well i'm working with all these different qualified intermediaries are they all going to operate the same probably not necessarily right if they're bringing in three or four different sets of exchange funds well we we always wire in the day before closing yeah and so we've we've always just said hey if you're closing on the 22nd we'll we'll wire them in on the 21st not a problem you know we get all the paperwork in order and everything's right. you know made sure that hey this is this is what it needs to be we have all of our title work i mean closing agents are ready to close titles ready to close attorneys are ready to close and we're just like hey all the paperwork's lined up our money's in so that you're not waiting on us yeah that's great and then i've had situations where people have said hey they need to close today oh i thought we were closing tomorrow it needs to be today can you get the money wired over yes i'm sending you disbursement documents right now we can have it over within the hour now wires take a couple hours to confirm sometimes but we we yeah. can do same day wires no problem and i mean i think that's that's maybe just the best practice that we've incorporated ourselves is more Smart. of this hey you can talk to us we're a concierge approach to 1031 exchange because we actually do these high level exchanges and not just say like, Hey, yeah, you know, tell me what you want to do, but making sure that you're even identifying properly, like on some of these high level deals. Yeah. Well, and I think that's really true. And, and it's, um, you know, it, I love having industry people that have a educational focus. And that's what I love about you guys like Nathan is that they're just willing to help. And sometimes the best thing, you know, we do it, you know, when we work with investors is like, you know what, we're really not the best fit for you, you should talk to these guys over here. Or, you know, what? why don't you like, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe a 1031 is not as good, maybe just sell it and don't worry about it. Or they're kind of a consultative approach that kind of help you through that process. And, and over 10 years of sales, when I was in medical device sales, I did very well. I won, you know, top 10%, the president's club, four years of the eight years I was eligible. And a lot of it just came from just being a person that wants to help people. And if you're really genuine, you want to help people. And I think a lot of the folks that do that are, are, that's their focus. And I've noticed with you, you, you're obviously a person, you want to help people, you want to help them along the process. What's another, uh, or any other uh, best practices that you see good QIs or qualified intermediaries do versus those that don't? Uh, that's a tough one. I mean, um, it's almost like, well, I've seen other qualified intermediaries do this and that's not what I want to do. I don't yeah. want someone to just be another number on a screen because right. it's some giant company. We are a family office. We do offer that kind of concierge approach and not, not to pitch our services, but we've just seen like, our goal is to help you complete a successful exchange, not to just get more sales, right? right. Like you're, you're coming to us and you're trusting us with your nest egg in many cases. And a lot of people just come to us like, what can I even do, right? And am I actually gonna defer these? And I can't give you a definitive answer because I'm not your CPA, but I can give you some rough guidelines and say, hey, this is what it appears like to me. These are the questions I would ask your attorney, or these are the questions I would ask yeah. your CPA, because your goal is full tax deferral, right? Oh, no, it's not. Maybe I actually want to take out a little bit of cash. Okay. This is how it would affect your exchange, broadly speaking. You know, is that something you still want to do? Oh, no, I don't want to do that. Okay. You know, like just, just yeah. offering that consultative approach, as you said, um, is not, not something I've seen for, for a lot of other QI firms. And so that's just a, a way that we've tried to set ourselves apart. A couple more questions. We just have a couple more minutes here. Um, uh, there's a rumor the 1031 will go away. Is it going to go away? Do you think it will ever go away? It keeps getting threatening by Biden or by different politicians, but do you think it will go away? I mean, it's been threatened before. Um, I think there, there's always going to be a threat of increased taxes, no matter what. It's always going to be there. The 1031 exchange is over 100 years old. It's been in the tax code for over 100 years. Wow. Um, it's gone through some iterations and some steps. It might go through a few more. Um, but at the end of the day, most of these real estate transactions and people are being paid, uh, you know, and providing jobs because real estate transactions happen. Think about all the attorneys, all the title, all the realtors, all the real estate brokers, right. lenders, all of those people are in business 
because people want to keep trading because there's an incentive to keep money in real estate. That's all the 1031 exchange is. It's like, hey, you did good with your real estate. It appreciated, you know, keep doing a good job and we'll we'll keep putting off those taxes for you so that you can keep doing good things with real estate. Right. Um, so if anything were to happen, I think uh, I think it might be rectified really quickly. Um, but yeah, in, in other words, there's there's always going to be a way, you know, to try and increase taxes, I think. So it's is, is the threat always going to be there? Probably. Will it go away? There's no telling. Well, that's and that's true, really. You know, people say, oh, there's loopholes in real estate, you know, tax loopholes. And I say, no, it's it's a loophole if your neighbor gets a, a you know, a tax break. But if it's you, it's an incentive. Right. So everybody wants the incentive. But the idea that it, it creates jobs, it creates uh, housing for people. It really helps people. Um, uh, also, I guess this is a, a little bit of a adjoining question, but what are we talked about this before we started recording? What are some of the other uh, kind of assets people don't normally think about? That you can 1031 into obviously it's got to be real property for real property but it doesn't always have to look like a house for a house or a, an apartment for an apartment what are some of the things that you've seen that are just like oh that's interesting you can do that yeah that's a that's a great question because many people come to me and they're saying okay i want to do a like kind exchange that's what it's referred to mm -hmm. um and like kind really just had two streams it was real property for real property or business for business well, the business for business doesn't exist anymore. So it's only real property for real property. And a lot of things are real property. So it's not just a, a duplex or a single family. It's an apartment. It's raw land. It's a billboard easement. It's an oil and gas lease. It's pieces of real estate, like in a syndication. I'm not buying 100% of an apartment building, but I'm buying 10% of an apartment building. That still constitutes as real property so long as you're receiving title to it. So you you can't go off in the deep end and buy like, you know, gold or silver or anything like that. But may, maybe you could buy a gold mine, you know, yeah. like yeah. if it's real land. And so maybe you could buy the assets that way. Um, but that's all. Like, this, this thing is a gold oil. mine, man. I got to buy it. It's a gold mine, right? That's what but I'm that's saying. all an oil and gas lease is anyway. It's like, hey, I'm buying the rights to what's under the ground. Maybe not what's on top still qualifies or. Uh, people will buy a mobile home that's on like a 30 year lease because it's a long term lease It's considered real property because it has longevity to it. So there's there's some interesting things that qualify. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Well, Nathan, I appreciate you for all the ways that you are looking to add value to people and obviously helping them through, uh, you know, the consultative approach of uh, a, a tax exempt exchange 1031s or even other ways to do that. So thanks for that. And just appreciated your friendship over the years you and your wife. And um, I, I wish that you guys were still in LA, but I know you're living your best life in Atlanta there. So um, how can people uh, reach out to you or connect with you? I know you're with American Accommodators, but what's a good way to get in touch with you? Yeah, I don't mind um, sharing my personal email address um, over over the air. Um, but if they go to AmericanAccommodators.com, they can, they can raise a question there and we'll get back to them. Um, or our shorthand for that is AA1031. So American Accommodators is two A's, AA1031.com. That's shorthand to, to get to the same website. Or they can email me directly at my first name, Nathan, at AA1031.com. And, and I can reach back out to him. Awesome. Thanks, man. Well, appreciate you. Thanks for being here today and look forward to connecting with you soon. All right. Appreciate you, Bronson. Thank you. So 1031s are really interesting to me. Obviously, anytime you can reduce, defer taxes, it's great. It's actually a very clean transaction to where, you know, you don't have to worry about having enough depreciation to cover everything because you're just simply deferring, deferring, deferring. And actually, there's a way in the tax code that you can actually set up the correct structuring and you can pass it on at a stepped up basis to your heirs. So they basically get it without having you having to really pay taxes on it at all, which is pretty amazing. So uh, if you're not familiar with 1031s, uh, reach out to Nathan, get connected on that. We do have some deals that allow for 1031 exchanges. So if you do have a 1031 exchange, reach out to us. We'd love to share some of the stuff that we are working on to be able to accommodate 1031s as well. So thanks for taking the time to educate yourself. We'll see you on the next episode of the Mailbox Money Show. You've been listening to the Mailbox Money Podcast. For more free resources, articles, and videos, go to bronsonequity.com. There you can download your copy of the special report, The Single Best Investment Strategy During and After a Pandemic. None of the information shared here is an offer to buy a specific investment, and this is for educational purposes only. Consult your financial, legal, and tax professionals and use your own common sense before making any investment decisions. Thanks for joining us, and be sure to tune in next time for more Mailbox Money.